Okay, I think we're up and running. So uh, my members uh, on the site, uh, I do some live interviews from time to time. And uh, this time I've got Tom Haynes, who's a fantastic drummer, uh, composer, musician, um, who I've worked with um, in the educational side of things uh, for a while, but um, I'm hoping to excitedly uh, work with him in a more musical context uh, this year. Uh, so I thought I'd get him on the line and uh, do a quick interview and just find out a little bit about what he does. Uh, I know that he's um, been involved in composition for a long time and has recently won some quite uh, prestigious awards uh, for jazz composition, so I'm going to ask him about that. And um, we're going to look at his compositions, um, what, what he does to compose, and uh, hopefully find out some tips uh, that will help uh, my listeners uh, um, continue with their studies and uh, become a professional musician. So, hi Tom. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. So I'm going to kick off straight away. I was talking about these um, jazz compositions. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about, um, you know, do you want to do the whole bigging yourself up of, uh, you know, which, yeah. what you've won recently? Uh, yeah, um, over the last three years I've won uh, three jazz composing or arranging competi uh, competitions. Um, the first one was uh, back in 2013, so the Brussels Jazz Orchestra International Composition Contest. Quite a mouthful. That is a mouthful. But, um, yeah, so that was uh, that was the last time it ran actually. So that was, um, uh, but it, I think there was something like 12, 10 or 12 winners previous to that. They run it every other year uh, up until then really. So I'm the current sort of holder of that. Um, at the time, um, with, with that one, the piece uh, was called Whistleblower, which was actually the first jazz orchestra piece I'd written for probably about five years, actually. So it kind of got me back on that, uh, uh, back on that focus. But um, and it was uh, the Duvel Jazz Award, which was um, the beer, the Belgian beer Duvel. Uh, they sponsored the whole event. And nice to get to drink any. Yes, yes, quite a lot of uh, <laughs> complimentary. Uh, Bottles of Duvel, including one very large one, as one of the prizes, uh, which was yeah. not. Uh, but yeah, that was um, that was probably of the three. That was probably the most uh, prestigious of the awards, mainly because uh, of the previous winners uh, and the judges involved in that one. So there was um, uh, <clears throat> Grammy Award-winning uh, producer called uh, Jeff Levinson. Who's, yeah, yeah, he's he's regularly um, on the the Grammy nominations. So he was very complimentary about it and, and, and some other composers from Germany and uh, some Belgian guys and a um, uh, Portuguese guy and a Swedish guy, some quite, uh, some quite good, good people. So, um, so that was really good, uh, really exciting. So were you, were you the only Brit then? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. They had, uh, I think it was something like 78 entries um, from uh, all over the world. So um, yeah, to get into the final four, with two Americans and a French chap um, was wonderful. We had a rehearsal session with the Brussels Jazz Orchestra um, and got to conduct and direct the rehearsal, which was great. And then the, the performance um, and then the judge, the judging. So, uh, and also actually I won two awards that night because it was a, there was an audience award as well. Um, so yeah. That, um, yeah, so the, the people in the audience also voted that my piece was best. <laughs> oh yeah, double whammy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah. That was, and that was all sponsored by Bose, you know, the, um, uh, oh, the speak speakers and headphones and things. So I got a nice uh, little prize from them as well. So that was good. Um, so how did, it, how did it all come about then? Did you read something online? Did you get invited to do it? No, I, I've been aware of the competition for a few years. Um, the first time I was aware of it, just a friend of mine um, who was studying, I think, at the Birmingham Conservatory at the time, uh, entered a piece and because it was the days before he was using uh, Sibelius he asked me to to copy it up for him so I yeah. so I did that and he sent it off I don't, he didn't get anywhere with it but um, I think I entered it a few years later without any kind of um, uh, success and then it was a that was 2009 I think and then 2013 was the was the next one I went to do and then um, so yeah that, that was uh, I just keep my eye on it, really, and, and as I say, since then it's not run since since I won it um, about two and a half years ago now. So, which is a 
a shame. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was, it, was it a case of just submitting the score then to yeah, them? And they, yeah, they submitting the score uh, and the Sibelius file uh, and an audio file as well. I think just a mock up because the idea is that they're new pieces that haven't been played, that haven't been recorded. You know, so they're fairly, uh, fairly raw, kind of um, unrealized things. I think that's the that was the idea of it. But some of the guys who'd won it previously have gone on to see some really good things. Um, some of the guys who are actually in the final, um, one of them, I think he's now a, uh, I think he's, well, they, the two American guys both studied at um, some of the top places over in America and they were name dropping all, all over the place with the, <laughs> who they worked with and who they studied with, you know, this, um, the same the same teachers as people like Maria Schneider and things like this. So, so it was wow. quite, quite um yeah it's quite exciting really um, look at you you're talking to me now so <laughs> yeah yeah but that that was the thing actually i suppose um that was the first thing i'd done for jazz rock for quite a long time it felt like a, a while and and it was just a kind of thing well the good thing about the competition was it had a deadline and it had a kind of a uh, a fingers crossed kind of uh, goal you know so so, absolutely yeah the, the deadline is the best motivator isn't it yeah, absolutely yeah, and yeah it, it works with, the, with the other two pieces as well i had um so the, the next year so 2014 there was a this is just something i saw i think it's on twitter originally was um they were billing it as the, the jazz arranger of the year award um a, a jazz educator called uh, eddie harvey i don't know whether you know of him uh it rings a bell yeah, I think he's a lot of the pieces that he he's um, he's written quite a lot of the pieces in the in the ABRSM jazz. Uh, okay. So, but anyway, he he was a, a a jazz arranger and you know a big jazz educator in the UK. Uh, he died, I think. I think it was maybe a year before that that award uh, was kind of advertised. Um, and again, it was a, just a case of submitting. Submitting music. It was essentially a jazz arranging award, that one, or a jazz arranging competition, but you could submit original things. So I submitted an original piece because uh, I don't tend to do arrangements, <clears throat> something that's never really interested me, to be honest. So I just, right. I just write. Um, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the bit for me, um, is the creating, creating new stuff. Um, yeah, and that similar kind of thing. It was three, three pieces performed down uh, in London at the Polish Jazz Cafe. Uh, in Hammersmith, and it was the National Youth Jazz Orchestra who were doing all the playing, which was good. Uh, and again, the, the judges were all kind of British jazz guys. So uh, Mark Armstrong, who's the who's the director of uh, Nigel, um, and Kate Williams, who's a jazz pianist. Um, Jason Yard, yeah, that's the one. that was that piece was called a uh, Mystery Dog, uh, or an alternative title as Mister E dog after my okay. son, Eric and the last one was uh, last summer um, the Barga Jazz Festival in Italy um, that was just send everything off by post this time um, so just I'd written a, a, a new thing and again saw a deadline and thought I'm gonna try and hit that and send it off it cost quite a lot to send it so what two two copies of everything two copies of the score two copies of all the part and that was an 18 piece thing because they had a vibraphone in there as well as the standard big band lineup um, so yeah, that, it cost them like fifty or sixty quid to send it off. Wow, bit of an investment just to, uh, <laughs> to hope. That yeah, but yeah. That that piece was called Yitzoid, uh, which was a, a a name that I used to call my other son Isaac. I used to call him Yitzoid when he was little. <laughs> so, uh, get my titles from there. Um, yeah, and that received a uh, it, it won the, the competition there. There was two there was two awards on that um, that competition. One for arranging. Which was um, they had to arrange uh, John Taylor pieces, which was um, quite poignant. Because I think he only died a few weeks before that. Uh, and then there was also an award for original pieces, and I won the original one. Obviously. Yeah, brilliant. I, I want to um, sort of backtrack a little bit and just ask a little, what was your story about sort of growing up as a musician and how did it happen? Uh, well. Um, I think initially it was all uh, it was about drumming. I think I had my my dad played in a uh, a Cayley band, like a folk band, uh, and I used to go to some of the the barn dances and that when I was very little and just sit and watch the drummer. 
and occasionally let me have a go and all this kind of thing. So, so sort of from a, um, that was the kind of initial contact probably um, in terms of actually doing music. I had piano lessons when I was quite small as well, but I absolutely hated them. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I couldn't get into them at all. And uh, I think uh, my, uh, my piano teacher had these two very yappy dogs and they would, I think one of them bit me once, so I didn't ever go back. <laughs> So yeah, but then we always had a piano in the house and, and sooner or later I just sort of started playing around on it really. I started to work out things by ear, uh, just songs that we'd listen to like, um, like soul songs or pop, whatever it was really. Um, so actually writing sort of was, been quite early, I always sort of seemed to make things up. So from quite early on that was kind of what I was interested in doing with music. Um, and then from there, I, I sort of did the whole, you know, did GCSE music, uh, even though I didn't think I could because I couldn't read music at that time. I thought, no, 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 can't do it, I'll do something else. But they convinced me that I should. I had some piano lessons again. Uh, but again, my piano teacher at the time said, oh, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing the, the, the grades. You should just do what you want to do on the piano because ultimately it'll be better than learning these pieces. So that's kind of what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and I sort of got into a few sort of, uh, rock bands mainly well, on the drums and things like that um, and through college just playing in sort of orchestras and, and band wind bands and things like that youth youth orchestras um, but um, yeah so the jazz thing sorry you do A levels yes I did A level yeah I did A level music and music technology um, back when music technology was kind of uh, in its infancy I guess as a on an Atari ST or something like yeah, that. Atari with uh, well first it was the first um, first sort of time of having a go at sequencing and I, I was really hooked from there and I think that that really helps sort of propel my uh, just spending time composing. I used to spend hours just fiddling around on cakewalk, which is what we had and yeah, um, just coming up with stuff and yeah. Uh, but initially, I, I was really interested in sort of film composing and, and that kind of thing was was very much something I was interested in. But um, so jazz didn't come to probably quite late on, I suppose, considering I've been interested in music for quite a while. Um, probably about no, maybe seventeen or so, sort of starting to get interested in that kind of thing. Okay. And um, sort of fast forwarding a little bit from there, so I know you've um, been involved in. Um education for was it about 10, 10 yeah. years of further education yeah I was teaching uh, in total for um yeah just over 11 years okay yeah so um you know i know recently you've you've moved on from that but are you, are you um sort of pleased about that time spent have you learned things have you kind of taken away positives from it absolutely yeah i mean i think when i when i first started teaching um i was very much from what, what I've been studying, what I spent my time doing as a musician was what I went in to teach. So I was started taking all the composing lessons and drum lessons and rhythm-based things um, and some performance stuff. But then after a while, I started to teach the music theory because um, I, I, was, I was quite late to music theory, studying it myself. Um, so I didn't learn to read music really until I was at the very beginning of my A-levels. Um, it's one of those things that <laughs> I remember... I, sort of the first day of music A level doing a, a test of how much you knew and I basically knew nothing. <laughs> um, which actually I think made me a, a, a decent decent teacher of music theory for, for kids of the same age. Um, so I kind of remember very vividly not knowing it. Um, so all the stuff that I'd learned for music theory had been sort of acquired from, uh, well, from 16 years old probably forward. So it's still, it's not something that I grew up knowing. Um, so I think that that definitely helped in terms of how I how I was able to put that across to other other students, um, but also it just that the old um, the saying of not really knowing something properly until you have to teach it is is really true. Definitely, yeah. Uh, uh, teaching music theory in particular uh, really made me sort of not necessarily sort of knuckle down the stuff that I didn't know, but but really kind of sure up how I know it, why I know it, and different ways to think of it um so everything from learning what notes are in particular major scales and the order of the sharps and flats and all those kinds of things 
uh, finding ways in which you can work it out rather than just having to know it, which I think was a um, a really positive thing for me. Uh, you know, just just the way I was thinking about music generally. Um, yeah, I remember to, talking to a lot of my friends at college, and they were saying about you know becoming musicians, and they they didn't want to go down the teaching route, and they just wanted to be you know artists and just play and do all this sort yeah. of thing, but actually since teaching myself it's actually cemented a lot of my yes. theory and the all the sort of application of the theory yes definitely. and i think it's a really useful thing to do mm. um just for you as a musician selfishly um but it helps that it kind of pays some bills as well but yeah, yeah absolutely yeah i think that from uh, from all the angles really because my throughout study because I, I i went on to um i got a degree in composing at coventry and then i did a went straight away and did an ma for 18 months up in Salford and it was all, all composing um, but even though I'd studied that time um, you know just composing I wasn't performing at all really um, it, I was still kind of composing in a very um, I guess kind of a quite an organic kind of way I wouldn't necessarily I never really had to do any sort of style copying or anything like that throughout my studies or um, or nothing too heavy so it was very much a case of always expressing what I wanted to write. And so actually then to teach it myself to, to other people who perhaps haven't even composed ever before um, really made me sort of evaluate how I go about doing what I do. Um, and sometimes sort of pick, not necessarily holes in what I do, but um, start to sort of find other ways in which you might get started. Uh, or um, So I've always been one really, I would compose just, if I could, just for the for the sake of creating music, there wasn't necessarily any great story or concept behind what I'd write. I just liked to write. Um, it'd be sort of the music for for the music's sake, if you like. Um, so actually, some people don't like don't work very well to that. So it's quite interesting yeah. to sort of branch out a little bit and um, uh, and look into ways of creating music which isn't quite so um, well, maybe a little more a little more abstract or conceptual or you know. To get, just to go in a little bit deeper into that and perhaps slightly more te technical, could you sort of give an example about how you would, you know, literally get off the ground with a composition? Uh, well, I think is I think that the when I first started writing um, the whistleblower tune, the one on the Brussels um, award, because it's something I hadn't I hadn't written something for a jazz orchestra for quite a long time, um, and that was all since. Sort of the, the back end of my degree that was really very much the interest that's what I wanted to write sort of sort of contemporary jazz orchestra kind of stuff yeah um, and the thing that really inspired me to, to get writing again was was just hearing some some new music some new jazz orchestra music um, and I think that I'm sort of inspired and influenced by music more than anything else um, either I, I hear something that I like that I want to try and emulate or something that I want to find out more about um, that one, I'd, I'd seen a, a, a Norwegian uh, jazz orchestra called Ensemble Donada at the um, London Jazz Festival. And it was amazing, really sort of blew me away. I was, it was fascinating music. And so I got in touch with the, with the, with the band, the main composer, uh, and luckily he gave me access to all the scores just for free, which was wonderful. Wow. So I spent a little while just sort of picking it apart and not analysing it sort of note for note, but more sort of, when you sort of step back from it, what, what does it look like? What, how, how are these kind of sounds created? Um, and so I'd, I'd take a few things from, from that, whether it be particular voicings of, of chords or particular chord movements or particular sort of rhythmic or textural kind of things um, and start to create just some very small ideas, really. Um, so what I tend to do, I suppose, is a, a, a long way around to answering the question, but... Uh, I sort of work in, in very sort of small cells to begin with, and it's normally uh, bass line uh, or chord, and very much the sort of the rhythmic feel. So, what kind of what kind of groove it's going to have? Um, and quite often with that, I like to explore um, sort of quite less sort of functional harmonies and just try and find some some chord changes, or even if it's just two chords or one chord that I sort of just manipulate bit by bit. Um, so, for example, the the whistleblower tune. The first the first idea I had for that was um, just a chord, which was basically two semitones together. So 
So it'd be an F and an F sharp and a B and a C. So kind of two tritones, a semitone apart from each other. Okay. And I'd sort of get a little groove going with that and just find different bass notes to go with it. Well, so as a, as a four note chords, not two two note chords. Uh, yeah, as a four note chord. Yeah. Nice. Um, it's just that kind of crunch. Um, and then yeah, so I, I would I would sort of just find some different bass notes for it. Um, uh, and then it sort of starts to become a, a groove thing. So you could it could just be that the piece could just be made up of you know that chord with two alternating bass notes or something like that. Um, so it's kind of quite a, a small cell to begin with, but it's kind of got quite a lot in it. It would have the rhythm in it, it would have a bass line in it, it would have the kind of harmonic language that I'm using, uh, which would then set the tone for where, where it goes next. So um, and that's generally how I how I tend to kind of get started is having having something small. Um, analyze a little bit of what I've got. So I say it was like two tritones together, a semitone apart, whatever. You know, you could analyze it that like that. You could analyze it as a chord symbol. I mean, it could have been. I think the first chord was D, so it would be like a, a D thirteen sharp nine or something. You could call it. So it's very much that you know. Once I understand what I've got, I can sort of manipulate it. So with that. Um, I just I moved the chord shape around, so I took that same kind of shape on the piano, if you like, which is just sort of that. <laughs> <laughs> just moved it around different places um, uh, with different bass lines, and then and then I have a, a kind of a a chord chart. Um, and I would say that it very much, melody very much comes last for me, though. Um, sometimes, almost sort of apologetically, I'll sort of throw a melody on and. Uh, either just by sort of hearing it and trying to play it, or by sometimes when I'm in Sibelius, I do most of my composing on Sibelius, um, sort of quite early on actually. Um, I'll just sort of get the rhythm that I like, and then just dot some notes around and see what it, see what it comes up with. Um, so kind of by chance, kind of by fluke, uh, but quite often it sticks. So you know, the melody comes last, but it, it, it always needs one. <laughs> to address it somehow yeah, this is this is fascinating and it's also I mean, it's good but it's quite frightening as well as considering i'm composing for uh well for you soon <laughs> uh, it's like uh, one day i um i cooked pasta for an italian which i didn't realize was such a stupid thing to do uh, but you know you're <laughs> trying to compose something for uh, know, uh, someone with an ma in composition but uh, uh it's actually quite good because I, I take a very similar approach and actually the yeah. idea uh, tends to get forgotten until the end, and uh, and then all of a sudden it's you know I have to sort of try and bend it into uh, the, yeah. the groove and the and the chord thing. So I know not everyone composes like that, but it's interesting to I was going to ask about your approach. Um, yeah. But then um, do you find like working on Sibelius? Um, I mean, I think you need to have a really sort of good knowledge of the software before you can use it as a proper tool. Is it? Would you agree with that? Um, I th think I, I think because I, I tend to I tend to work in a way that most of my ideas will, will originate on the piano, and so uh, or just sort of from the piano they'll go into my head, and then I'm sort of kind of composing. You know, whenever I have um, a quiet moment, whether I be driving, even though I'm not thinking actual what the notes are or what the chords might be, I'm thinking in my head where they would go. You know, sort of already. So, um, I think that with Sibelius, um, I do tend to use it sort of almost straight away. Once I've got an idea, I'll notate it. Um, partly so, all those things that you, that Sibelius is wonderful at doing, like copying and pasting, uh, <laughs> transposing very easily, and moving things uh, to different instruments and different staves and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think for that. I don't think you need to have an amazing knowledge of, of Sibelius to be able to do that. Um, but I think to get to a point where you can actually sort of compose freely on it, uh, it, it yeah, I, I would be a bit more of an experienced user of Sibelius before I, I tried to sort of compose from, from scratch on it. Um, but I can do that now, and I often do do that now. Um, so the kind of phases, if you like, the way, the way I would compose is, as I say, the ideas come from piano, and I'll, I'll sort of play around with it there, lots of sort of singing things and trying things out. Then I'd pop it into Sibelius. Um, if it was to be scored out, which most, uh, most of my jazz stuff is, then it, it sort of goes into Sibelius before um, 
I don't play around in logic very much with it, um, depending where it is, I suppose. But um, see, so yeah, I'll get it into score straight away, so I can really see what I'm doing. Because uh, for me, with the, with the, a large ensemble like a big band, uh, I don't just think of it as being an arranging task. I think of it the composing and the orchestration as being one of the same thing. So okay. the whole use of the orchestra or use of the instruments and the different colours and textures comes um, is almost sort of part of the initial thinking. Yeah. Which again, I know is is not. Um, not as well, a lot of people don't do that. They'll, they'll write a tune and then arrange it and things. Um, yeah, but mine kind of is part of the same task. But it's partly because I, I love the sound of the uh, or the different sounds that a jazz orchestra can kind of achieve. So that is very much in the forefront of my of my mind when I when I start to compose. So at the piano, imagining that this is I don't know muted trumpets and flutes or whatever. That's that. Yeah. Do you find that um, your motivation is kind of the same throughout the writing pro progress or do you uh, process even? Or do you kind of have slumps and you just think, is there like a really exciting part of composing and a really dull part of composing? Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't know, perhaps not dull, but there's sort of the frustrating bit. Because um, one of the things that I don't like about Sibelius or any software is that you start to look at the, time you look at how much you've actually composed in terms of a, of, of a duration and that yeah. annoys me um but i can't get away from it partly because of you know when you cause i'm still kind of on cds quite a lot you put the cd and you know how long the, the piece lasts for before you play it this kind of thing and um and so i'm kind of quite i don't want to but i'm quite conscious of how much i've composed and whether i've composed enough before i can i don't know um look into a solo section or something like that. Um, it's one of my bugbears, I think, in um, in jazz music, uh, where, because I'm a composer, for, for first and foremost, is that there's not enough composed stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, it goes into the solos all too soon, and, um, you know, I, I want to hear the head again, or I want to hear it do something else before it moves on. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's the problem I have with jazz generally, and why I'm not a great jazz listener, because um, it's not the... It's not the sort of the, the artistry of the improvising that that interests me. It's it's what happens before that. So, yeah. um, what was the question uh, about dull and uh, yeah, yeah. information? Yeah, I, I find um, I, I do get frustrated quite quite easily with, with writing, and and I think it's because I don't try and write things. I don't have a plan necessarily for how I'm going to write. I don't sort of figure out um, all my different sections or themes before I start. And I don't think about the form I'm going to use uh, generally, um, unless I'm on occasions I have said, "Well, I'm definitely going to write something which is like a uh, like an arch type form. I'm definitely going to have uh, a, a rondo form or something like that," which I did once. Um, other than that, I, I, I tend to kind of go with the flow a bit more and see where it, where it leads me. So there are times where I get frustrated because I don't know. I, I kind of lose a bit of bit of um, context of the, of the piece when you listen to it too much you kind of you forget where you are you don't know how many how long that idea can go on for before it needs to move on so i i when i listen back to some of my earlier pieces particularly when i was studying for my ma some of the, the stuff i've done uh with that uh, i think it moves on far too quickly like it doesn't stay in one place long enough so sort of on reflection I think we're to, to trust the idea if you've got something that works and sounds good and if you can get away with playing it twice rather than once then do this kind of thing <laughs> um, mainly for sort of listening purposes you know uh, trying to put yourself in the position of being the listener like listening to, the, to my piece for the first time you know what, what's it going to be like is it is it going to be too flitty around from one thing to other or is it going to stay on one thing for just too long or is it going to go to the solos too quickly all these kind of things um, so that's the main source of frustration when I'm when I'm writing. It's just trying to keep a sense of perspective of, of what it what the music sort of how the music comes across to the listener rather than to me. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you've done um, a lot of work with uh, composing for dancers. So yeah. Are they sort of set parameters that you have to stick to very rigidly in terms of tempos and grooves and things like that? Or? Um. 
the work that I've done has been quite varied, I suppose, on that front. Um, the most recent thing I did, which was uh, an, the National Youth Ballet, which I got to actually got to work with the National Youth Jazz Orchestra again, which was nice, or an octet from there. That was very specific. I mean, the, the choreographer I was working with was uh, sort of an emerging choreographer called uh, Jamie Neal, who was, had a very clear idea about what his piece was going to be. Um, it's kind of contemporary ballet, not necessarily contemporary dance, which I've also done stuff for, which is a lot, uh, tends to be a lot freer and more open. But with that, it was very much a sense of it needs to be this duration. Uh, so each, I think it was split into, it was a 15 minute piece split into, I think it was 10 sort of sections or 10 scenes, if you like. Um, and that was the way he was thinking it from the choreography point of view. So when he gave me the, the brief, if you like, it was each each section had a very specific kind of kind of thing that he wanted. And because you know, that was a jazz thing, um, I ended up writing some quite standard jazz stuff, which I don't really do, <laughs> uh, which is good fun and a good exercise, definitely. But um, yeah, it's very strict tempo, very strict duration, um, and but for some of the other things I've done, uh, well, and also the dancers that, that I've worked with, um, sort of so far. Have, They've always sort of come saying they want this type of thing. Um, they they have particular tracks that they will reference that they like, and they want to create this kind of mood or this kind of tempo or this kind of or they like the use of the instruments in this piece or or the energy in this piece. So straight away, I've had um, quite a, a concrete kind of reference to kind of work to, and sometimes I've even sort of worked out exactly the the, the BPM of, of a piece. Um, and taking exactly the same form or structure and uh, try to analyse really what goes on in the music and then try and come up with something which is obviously not the same because it would be pointless otherwise, but to um, have something which is new enough and original enough to kind of fulfil that, that need for bespoke music, um, but that gives them the same feeling that they, that they want um, to write, to, to choreograph to. Um, that's been more the case, I think, with more the contemporary dance I've done. Um, oh, that's cool. That's slightly more yeah. kind of um, uh, prescribed way of writing, I guess, from both sides, both from the the person who's commissioning me and also from how I go about doing it. Um, and that is less of a. Um, I, I judge that really on whether they like it, whether they um, are happy with the. What the product that I've given them, yeah, very much sort of composing to order, but at the same time, because of the nature of of, of the um, of the work and the, and the dancers as well, it's quite often there's some freedom in that, and there's there's some you know creative um, things to, to add and play around with, and, and sometimes they'll like it, sometimes they won't, and so it goes through different drafts. Um, so in some ways, it's very good to actually have uh, to be commissioned by someone in that sense. So that to create music for something where they ultimately have the control and the decisions to make. It sounds like the quality of the brief is uh, makes your job a bit easier. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, but also just to be able to evaluate or assess whether whether what I've done is what they want. Um, I mean, I've worked work with some dancers who just say, yeah, it's really nice, I like it. Um, <laughs> and not too critical, which is fine, because if they like it, that's great. Uh, and some where they say, oh, what can we do? Can we do something else here? Can we do something else there? I don't like the way it does this, I don't like the way it does that. Um, so a lot more kind of, uh, more more of a process, more drafts involved and things like this. But um, That's quite good though, because one of the things about composing on your own, which I've, which most of my jazz stuff has been, is that you have to try and make those decisions yourself. And sometimes, a bit like what I was saying earlier, it's difficult to kind of get that perspective sometimes. Yeah. Actually, that sort of sort of leads on to my last-ish question um, about productivity. You know, how to get things done. Do you have sort of things, routines, um, you know, daily rituals or anything that you actually uh, do in order to to get the work done? Uh, not so much. I think the, the way I, I tend to to write, because you know, um, especially when I was working uh, at the college and teaching a lot more, is that I had to sort of find find the time to, 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 to write or to think about the music. Uh, again, it comes back to something I said earlier on, is in that once I've made a start with something, and that will normally be at the piano, or by listening to something and, and trying to, whatever it is, jazz or, or work for dance or whatever, 
is that the, I'm kind of feel like I'm composing it even when I'm not an instrument or not sort of sat down and saying, right, I'm composing now. So um, I drive quite a lot for gigging and teaching and that. So I will often be, have, it'll be in my head and I'll have some of my be best ideas of what to do when I'm driving. Uh, I occasionally um, record myself singing things just so I don't forget them. Um, but what that does is that when I do actually get to sit down at the computer uh, or at the keyboard or whatever I'm, I'm doing, um, it means that I know what I'm doing when I get to sit down. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't wait to decide what to do. Um, that, that kind of comes whenever there's a moment, really. Um, so, yeah, it just means that when I do sit down to actually get on with the work sort of properly, fully, then I'm not scratching my head. I'm, I'm trying things out. Um, yeah, I, I suppose <laughs> it, it's it, for me. It's it's about um, always finding a, a, a solution for the thing you're trying to get get past, whether that's by by singing when you're in the shower or driving, um, or by trying something out that you've never tried before. Um, at the moment, I've because I feel like I get I get stalled very quickly. Of particularly when I'm writing sort of original stuff, not to a brief, um, I get stalled quite quickly of, of how to create new sounds and new things so at the moment I'm, I'm sort of messing around with 12 tone grids to see what see what <laughs> things I can get out of that and it's meant that I've been quite productive because I can just try things out and Sibelius is great for that um, like putting things inverting things putting things backwards and whatever you know uh, so it gets sort of instant results that you can you can sort of assess whether you like them or not and quite often I quite like them. So, <laughs> uh, it's finding sometimes finding ways to get get past little hurdles by by throwing a bit of a um, bit of a curveball in the way you write, uh, and not because I'm very analytical with the way I write. Um, so I will I will um, throw out ideas because they're too simple, or throw out a chord progression because it's a two five one because I don't really do two five ones. I'm not going to put one in my piece, so no, you know things like that. So I, because I'm very analytical, I, I sort of try and find ways where the analysis of the, the kind of the, the content isn't isn't a, an issue so the 12 tone thing does that for me sometimes or by trying processes like as i say like um, the backwards or fragmenting things i do quite a lot taking odd notes from little phrases and, and putting them in a different context just to maybe you know be the start of a, of a new section or, or be the start of um, a development of an idea or something like that so there's a certain amount of uh, the sort of the analysis, the kind of the um, the hard work, if you like, the, the process or the, the craft, rather than just the inspiration. And do, uh, it sort of made me think of something else now about being sort of original. Have, have you? Because I've always had this uh, sort of it feels like a bit of a curse, really, about doing things differently just because you know you're just doing it to spite my face but just you know to try and be original but I've, it's almost like it's taken me a long time to to realize that um you know there has got to be some sort of imitation of something you know you can't just create from a, a vacuum and uh yeah you know, i've really struggled with that have you, have you got any sort of inner demons about being original or <laughs> You yeah. said about not putting two five ones into your piece. Yeah, I mean. that's been something from from very early on, really. I think um, I'm that when I listen to music, I like to be surprised, and I like to, um, uh, and I know when it comes because I won't be able to sort of stop smiling. Uh, when I saw this this band in uh, the London Jazz Festival, the Ensemble Donada, almost within minutes of them playing, I just I couldn't stop smiling. It was just like <laughs> what I love, and so it's. Just and that's that's why I think that um you know my first response to anything that I love is, is I, I need to find out what it is. Um, so my originality sort of I think comes from a hybrid of of stealing stuff which is original. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, stealing some little things and also merging them with what I do um, because I think everyone that's uh, sort of commented and, and particularly like the, the judges commented comments on my on my award winning pieces was that they can tell that I'm a drummer. Because of the detail in rhythm and, and the sort of the, the variety in, in the way that the rhythm works, 
Um, and that I think is is something which I do very naturally. So I don't I don't think that that's my thing, but it's quite it's becoming clear that that actually is my thing. Um, so there's some some of the things which are kind of quite um, intentional and, and and devised. So when I I, I take particular kind of uh, obscure kind of chord uh, and bass note relationships and things like that, uh, and try and play around with that. Um, that's something that I kind of work at, and I, and I find ways of making those things work. But that in com in combination with the rhythmic thing, which obviously comes more naturally to me, um, or that's what comes across. Um, I think that is is how I how I've ended up sort of writing stuff, which is not particularly like lots of other stuff. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I've um, it's my it's my one intention really to as a composer for the jazz stuff more than anything else is is to is for it to be original and for it to be interesting and it to uh, it to not to be too much like anything else. Um, but using a, a jazz orchestra or even a, a quartet or a quintet, you know, there's that that sound has an identity, and I think that's one of the things with with big band music. Uh, and why, to be honest, I don't like a lot of it is that it, it doesn't have it doesn't have its own identity because they're, they're they're just the same. They're the sort of um, pastiches of each other, um, and that's the kind of more standard stuff. Um, so my my listening of of and it tends to be mostly Scandinavian bands, to be honest. That's where it's it's, it's ended up. But uh, there's something about whether it's the language that's used from that which which makes me want to investigate it and then take bits to use in my own music. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that um, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, for today. But uh, just one last question. But what is the future for you then? And what are you what are you planning? Well, um, my my main kind of focus at the moment is to find a way of, uh, of funding uh, a recording of the jazz orchestra. So I can some, so my my award winning pieces plus some others to actually get them recorded properly and um, try and get them out there a bit um, and promote it and, and see what comes of that really. That, that's my sort of main ambition, if you like, over the next uh, 12 months or so. Um, and the, the dance thing is, is something which is a little bit clearer. Uh, I can contact people and ask them if they need music and things like that. So uh, I do a, a fair amount of networking and, uh, and things for that to try and get more work on that front. Um, but that's kind of as a uh, just composed to order. <laughs> and, then, and where can people find you and um, what's your, to contact you? Where would they find uh, you? My, uh, my website is www.tomhainesmusic.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I do all that stuff um, just to try and keep it uh, keep some kind of presence. That's yeah, important these days. <laughs> really, really important. Um, and, and try. I also try and I try and share a lot of the things that I think are important for other people, like uh, Jay Riley's wonderful music. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think that it, it's good to not ju not just for the support of the people, but also to kind of promote the things that you think are important. Um, and the things that because uh, things on Facebook and things, it's uh, it's so easy to to, to share things, and it's also very easy to miss them. So sharing them once is often not enough. <laughs> so, so share, share more. Um, but yeah, the website is probably the best thing for my mind, and everything links to from there. So yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I will um, I will put up some uh, links then to your wonderful. stuff, and uh, I really appreciate you giving up all this time and uh, to have a chat with me yeah. and uh, you know the the members of my site and. Uh, uh, hopefully, um, people will have got some. I mean, not actually, me just listening to you now has got some amazing stuff that I'm going to be using. So, um, thank you for that, and I will, um, I will be seeing you soon with this project. Yeah, looking forward to that definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right, I will. Uh, I'll see you soon, then, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cheers.